Hello everybody and welcome to our Bringing the Community Along uh, webinar with John Armstrong. John has been presenting uh, with Imagine More for many years now and is a senior uh, trainer in social role valorisation and um, I know I personally have gained a lot out of what John has to share and I know the camera community have certainly um, valued his contribution to improve the lives of people with disability. There might be a little bit blurry, um, but we really just ask that people can bear with us and, and hopefully the, the connection will get stronger as the hour goes on. But I'm sure what John has to share, you won't need to be reading what's on the whiteboard behind him. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's great. Well, oh, thank you so much, Jan. That's great. Thank you for uh, sponsoring this again, bringing us back together. So hi, everyone. Uh, great, great to be together once more and uh, to see your interest. This is a really critical concept, of course, um, a topic for us today. Um, after all, if we want people to experience the good things of life, you get the good things of life by the associations, interactions and relationships with other people. And so th this particular topic today is that all important question of how do we bring people into the company of others. Um, and so it's, a, it's, it's kind of an end point discussion. And uh, having done all that we can now, how do we actually create conditions where our presence in the community becomes embraced by members of that community? And so we want to have a look at some of the empirical uh, conditions that we might establish as we support someone as we enter that community. So really really critical topic with a little while today to talk about this and we welcome your questions as you write them in the chat line and we'll have a nice discussion of those at the end as well. Uh, everyone seeks to belong and of course we're making a connection here between belonging and participation but there's also a connection between the roles that we have being a means for us to participate. If you've got no roles then there's no mechanism for you to, to really be able to participate. Uh, roles are kind of a prerequisite. And that's why we often see that, that over history and so on, uh, and in the last number of decades, we've worked pretty hard to bring people into a physical presence within their community. But there's still a long way to go in terms of the social issues. So a number of the surveys and different pieces of research that looked at the level of uh, social involvement between people with disabilities um, and members of the community is still extremely low and disappointing in spite of all the efforts that we've seen. Uh, certainly physical presence has come a long way from the old days where virtually everybody body was segregated away from the rest of society. Uh, now there's much less of that, still some, um, and some programs you'll still find that that's the case. There's not even a physical presence. But today we're wanting to really focus on the aspect of the, the social aspect of bringing people together so that interactions and uh, relationships, these connections can be made. Now, the reason for this, of course, and the connection to roles and participation, of course, is that, that roles enhance the status of someone. We tend to see people through the roles that we perceive them as having, and that includes the status that we give to those kind of roles. And, and therefore, when a person holds a valued role as opposed to a devalued role, it changes the way people are seen. It does that automatically. Uh, you don't have to have a march or protest or anything like that to get people's attention. They just have to see the role. Um, so valued roles are an antidote for devalued roles, you might say. and and creates then this segue into people seeing people through their role and through the status of that role. And uh, in other words, the person becomes valued because of the value attached to the role. The incumbent of the role gets, gets valued more or less at the same level that the role itself is valued. And notice that this is an interesting approach because it, it contrasts with a lot of talk about empowering people and people being given power. And that's more of an ideological approach, as though the power is the problem and therefore you need to have power. And quite often it ends up being power over other people that used to have power over you. But we find that people automatically treat others well when they're valued. And that therefore we've got here that value is what makes the difference, not the power that they have. So I hope the screen is clear for you, but I'll be going through these various points verbally, even if you can't see this uh, all that well.
Um, the key point of SRV, of course, uh, social role valorization, and we teach this in the longer two-day event. We even have a four-day event that's very in-depth. But the key point of SRV is that the more roles you have and the more valued are those roles, the more chance you have of having access to the good things of life. And it's the good things of life we want people to have access to. Belonging is one of the good things of life. Contributing to other people, growing and learning, being as healthy as possible, being financially secure, having valued roles, having a job that makes sense and receiving uh, remuneration for it, having a home and having control over those things, having a satisfying degree of autonomy and control over your life. These are the things we talk about when we say we're after the good things of life for people. And the connection here is related to many of those things come from other people, people you live with, people you're surrounded by, and therefore that's related to the roles they see you as holding, the kind of worth that they give you as a result of that. So having then uh, established certain roles that we're after for someone, um, and we'll come back to, well, where do these roles come from? Because quite often a nice starting point is around some of the interests that people have, uh, things that people are already motivated to know and learn about and to become. And in that sense, we may start at a very young age to help people while at school, um, experience many kind of things in their life and to find out what turns them on. We do this to all children. As we grow up, we may have been ushered into all sorts of experiences, some which we really liked and took off with and others that we didn't or others we didn't like in the beginning, like learning violin or another instrument. But in time, we grew to love it. And therefore, those things then become a role for us. Um, but when we're establishing a role for people, and especially a role that's taking place within the community, because if we want people to participate alongside other valued people, then they're going to need a role. And there are a number of things that we need to pay attention to. So this becomes very practical. How do we support someone to hold a valued social role in a community context? And there are a number of things that we can pay attention to that facilitates the person knowing that they're in that role, but also facilitating other parties knowing that they're in that role as well. Things that are immediately recognizable that, that say, here is the role that this person is in. We can tell because of these four factors. And the four factors are these. The first one is that the person is in a particular physical setting that incorporates that role. And it's interesting, the power of a physical setting. You've seen this in your own life, the, the, the behavior you have while at home versus the behavior you have while at work versus the behavior you have while you're at the pub. Each of those three different physical settings draws out of you a whole different set of behaviors. And we do this quite unconsciously, you know, automatically walking into situations and then performing according to the demands of that circumstance, whether it's on a tennis court or a swimming pool or down at the beach or fishing by the river or going camping. All of these physical situations make particular demands upon us about how we behave and relate to other people. Quite often we've devalued people by putting, putting them into physical settings that are confusing about the expectations that they reveal. We might, for instance, put adults in a, in a physical setting that, that suggests that they're children, that has all sorts of adornments, even furniture that's more designed for children than it is for adults, and therefore tends to provoke then the very behavior that is signaled by the physical setting. Now, don't underestimate the power of the physical setting. It sets everything else in train. You get the physical setting right. It's just remarkable how the other things tend to flow more naturally. In many of our discussions and workshop exercises, it's interesting when we draw out from an audience what they've seen and taken notice of, the physical setting is often the last thing they thought of as having been the component that influenced what they thought a role was about and where the signals for that role came from. So that's quite fascinating because the physical setting is the first idea about what makes this person into that role. I can tell they're a tennis player because they're on a tennis court. There's a really good prompt <laughs> to run about and chase a ball. 
And uh, if you're not in that setting, it's hard to provoke that behavior. And it means, therefore, that we can go into a setting and see, is there anything in this environment that doesn't fit with the expectations for the role we are after? And then root it out and get rid of that because there's conflicting and confusing expectations. Day programs were a wonderful place to visit where you found various expectations across purposes. Was it a school? Was it a childcare centre? But adults are here, but look at the environment. And then later we begin to see some of the other things that play into these confusing messages as well. So physical setting. The next one, of course, is that you're known by the company you keep and that that company also influences the way that you behave and signals the kind of roles that you are in. And uh, so any of the relationships, any of the kind of groupings that people might have together, and this includes relationships with staff as well that, that is in this. What kind of relationship expectations is set up? with the other people, whether they be other clients, are there valued people in the presence uh, present here um, that I can imitate and follow and, uh, and live up to? Or is the grouping completely segregated? Is the grouping too big for what it is we're wanting to do? Is it too small? Um, is, there, is, there, is it too diverse uh, in a sense, particularly in order to support the needs of that group of people? Are there too many people of varying needs here? And for instance, like in a nursing home, you might have 120 residents of a nursing home and they're all quite different. They may all be elderly, but the age range is enormous quite often. And, and also the needs within the group. It's almost impossible to respond to their needs and therefore everybody gets lumped together. And you start to see mass management emerge. You want to treat someone individually here. You'll need to have a grouping that's small enough for that. You also want the person to look as good in the eyes of other observers. And therefore, you may not want to group them alongside lots of other devalued people as well because that might be overwhelming. We'll come back to this point. But it sends a signal to other people to stay away. This isn't a group you want to get to know. As opposed to being a single person, perhaps that's within a context where everybody else is valued and therefore this person is valued along with them by the association. So you're known by the company you keep by. So by association, if he is there, then that means he too is valued just like everybody else. The next feature is then what do you have to do there? What are the activities that you have in mind? And do people know what to do? And how is time used? And are these things consistent with the role that we're aiming for? Again, back to the nursing home, you see everybody sitting around doing nothing all day quite often. And so there's, there's life wasting occurring. And that too sends a very big signal about what role these people are in. So like they're already dead type, type of role. So the schedule the timing of the activities, the rigorousness of the activities that is consistent with the role that you are after. What are we expecting people to be doing when they're in this role? Is this person doing those things as well? Then there's other imagery, a bunch of other imagery that is symbols and, and ideas about what people are doing and what they are like. Sometimes this comes from the way people have spoken to and about and the way people speak themselves presents a kind of imagery about uh, this role. Now, either have a role confirmation or or not. You might have, you know, people are dressed as boys and girls and you look out and they're 70 and 80 years of age. And so there's this conflict between the language being spoken and the, the rhetoric, particularly about respect and and, and these kind of things. Also what people look like. And quite often the looks also um, incorporates any possessions that people have close to them. So cooks, for instance, are expected to hold knives and to chop things unless they're murderers or something, then you might see the knife in a... But it, you can see then that wearing an apron and, and perhaps having a hairnet or a chef's hat, um, all of these things shape the appearance and therefore the role expectation that goes with, with that appearance. And then there might be other media. You often find that people get dropped into the community in white buses. Sometimes there's lots of symbols on names and, and names of services that are on the side of these things. And that too... Um, can impose itself. Even the way funding occurs or fundraising occurs also reminds us then might present people in such a poor way or it might not. It might present people in a highly positive way. 
And what's interesting about these four things is that you can memorize them and you can basically walk into any future setting that you're wishing to encounter and support someone into and begin to analyze it in terms of what is it the situation expects of someone acquiring that particular role. So even something quite, uh, you might say, passive to some extent uh, is to be a football barracker, a, a, a team supporter. So if you're going to go to the footy, what does this look like? And therefore, supporting the person to be exactly in accordance with that so that whenever the person is seen, they're recognized for the role that they occupy. Notice too that roles are made up of two major components and we've got them over here. One is to do with competencies associated with the roles. Uh, it's not just skills. We use the term competency because it's wider than skill because it incorporates habits and disciplines that go with it as well. So uh, and the competencies that are demanded and required. Um, now, each of these things, the first three things, also facilitate competencies. Does the physical setting allow people to do well at what it is they're doing? You know, is the desk the right height? Do they can they get in the building and you know, all those adjustments that might need to be made? Can they hear in the situation? Is it comfortable? Is the temperature okay? All of those kind of things. And and then the groupings that uh, might facilitate growth as well. Is it a grouping that inspires the person to imitate behavior of others and to learn to do things they weren't able to do before? Or is it the other way? And uh, and then, of course, the activities that are demanded upon people, that there's a, uh, an expectation of growth and development that's associated with that. So high demand uh, that the person raises up to, the appropriate level of expectation as opposed to life-wasting activities where there's really nothing happening or things are being done with you that demeans your age uh, or, or your capacity. Um, now, we don't learn competencies in the image domain, but there is an image associated with competency. Does the person look competent in the ways that we've described so far, but are there also other images associated with looking the part and being competent? Then the other factor, of course, is image. Do people have the appropriate appearance? Again, through all four, how the physical setting makes me look, how the groupings make me look, how the activities make me look. We once visited a service for elderly people where they were given burial shrouds to sew. What did the appearance of an activity of burial shrouds sewing for elderly people project to the observer? Being surrounded, by the way, by flowers that had been donated by recent funerals. So the combination of this, what we call death imagery, and it was all through the nature of the activity. So that gives us something to go on. We've now got a means by which we can check out uh, and see that everything is in place before we step in. And to understand too, that if you're working in generic settings, community settings, therefore, what are the demands of these things? What is it that people have to do if they're to occupy roles within these settings? And what is the demands of the physical setting that we might have to pay attention to? Now, we go for this. We want to really work towards people having and receiving these valued expectations because we know that a valued role is even stronger in shaping the mind of the observer than is the impairment. In other words, when we see anyone in a valued role, it completely retranslates the way we see that person. And that's what we're interested in. How might the the real ability and assets of this person get recognized? You know, we often say, you know, we want them to be seen as a person. Well, how do we do that? And it's not so much just berating the community, but to present people in a valued role that already then retranslates that impairment. So you think of Stephen Hawkins, who had almost no capacity to meet his own needs. And yet, through his role as a brilliant person, as a professor of physics and so on, um, completely retranslated the way other people saw him and the, the high level of value that was held, even though he was very dependent on other people for almost everything. That's so an interesting example of that.
Now, remember too that some people will have different levels of vulnerability to being easily harmed, and we have to take this into account as well. For instance, some people might have severe or multiple disabilities, and for them to venture into the community as part of a group of clients together may be so severe because of their particular vulnerability in being seen as incapable, even subhuman, and therefore unable to occupy any of the valued roles associated with these settings. Therefore, we'd need to be very careful that even two people together may be overwhelming to the observer and their expectations for these people holding valued roles because of the additional vulnerability, the ease to which they are seen in very negative ways. So we've got to take care of that. And, and uh, so you know that some things about people will never be accepted in the community, even with a lot of community education. So we need to try and reduce anything about the person that's likely to provoke rejection in spite of, you know, our efforts to educate and get the community to be inclusive, these kind of things, when they encounter certain people that we have presented poorly, then it's just going to be a natural reaction, not necessarily an acceptable reaction, because we know the person here has something to offer. It's how do we present the person so that others discover that as well. As uh, We want to present people as having assets not as a problem for the community to accept. Communities are interested in the assets people bring, not their problems. So how does Wolfensberger define this business of bringing people into the company of others? Um, he had a very nice definition, and it's one of the things that's missing in our discussion about inclusion, is that we all may mean something slightly different when we use that term. Um, but he talked about personal social integration valued societal participation. And he talked about it being a, a kind of high benchmark of a, a cultural, culturally typical number of interactions, relationships, connections, and roles with valued people in valued settings and in valued or at least normative activities. So there you go. So whenever something doesn't work, you can actually use this definition as a way too of thinking it through. You can go back to those role communicators, the setting, the grouping, the activities, the miscellaneous imagery and say, is there anything wrong in here? But we could also say, where has it gone wrong here? Is that we haven't got the right people? You know, have we not the right setting and we, we haven't got the right activities? And because a feature of the right activities is also at the right time. You get the time wrong and we find that no one's there. And uh, I've started to go swimming again. The pool is open, but I keep selecting a time and no one else is there and they're probably glad for that. And uh, I have the pool to myself. But if I wanted to, to interact with people, which is not a great need I have because I already get to do that, I'd have to pay attention to the time in which we conduct that as well. And uh, don't want to go bowling. If bowling is the role we're after, we'd like to go when other people are there as well. And uh, now I'd like to, to finish our time together and then open it up for some questions because there may be many questions about this. Um, and to talk about at the level of some tactics because we've, these are fairly high order strategies that we've been discussing so far. And what's nice about a strategy is it applies just about everywhere. That is, they're universal strategies. But now we're coming down a little bit and we're in the area of a tactic. Uh, these are smaller in scale and they might not always apply to the situation we're in. So sometimes we have to make a decision or not as to whether to use the tactic or not. So I wouldn't want this to sound like a recipe that you must follow. It's more of a tactic that might be relevant for the situation you're in. But in other cases, it might not be. So we're getting closer as we bring people together and we want to create the conditions where the interaction, the connection, interaction can begin to occur. And out of that might come a relationship. Of course, we can't guarantee relationships. Anyone who's trying to form a relationship in some of the online sites, it's a bit hit and miss, isn't it? And you try and do all the things that increases the chances that it might be successful, like you 
you try and look nice, try not to lie about your age, things like that, and you hope that there might be a spark of a relationship. And uh, there's a nice saying that says, though, that you've got to kiss a lot of frogs before you get a prince. And sometimes these kind of things apply here as well. So if it doesn't go well, it doesn't mean you've necessarily made many mistakes. It's just that there's not the spark of interest that, that uh, you're hoping for. And uh, so don't give up on that. Not everybody loves us in the world. In fact, I saw one piece of research that suggested about 10% of the population hates us at any one time, even though they've never met us, just people like us, you know, and um, maybe me rather than you. And uh, so we're wanting something for sustainable success. We want to know that something we're setting in place isn't a one-off necessarily, but the beginning of things happening at a much greater level. Like a, we open a door and sometimes we see a cascade of roles, one role giving way to another role and another role, and it, it increases and gets enlarged and it deepens. And that's quite wonderful to see. And there seem to be two requirements for this, though, if it's going to work. And the first is that the person is able to cope with the group. So if you're coming into a group setting, which is what we often mean when we talk about community, you know, it might be a local singing group, it might be a craft group, an uh, art group, and uh, could be a gardening group. And, uh, and and sometimes these groups are also part of employment. So that might be like a work team, uh, Jim's mowing service, you know, so a person gets a job um, as part of that. And therefore you want the person to be able to cope with the demands of the group because groups have requirements for success. They'll give way a bit. At the beginning, they're a bit tight, but when they get to know you, then they loosen up a little bit because they come to value the various assets the person brings. They get to discover the lovely things about this person, perhaps their sense of humor or their ability to be punctual or their ability to know when something's not done right and tells everybody about that. Uh, I know lots of people who do all of those three things. and But the group might need to discover that. And when they do, they become a little bit more flexible. That is, they're more willing perhaps to put up with unusual things about the person because they see the assets of the person. And that looms larger than any of the problems that they see. And uh, so the person is able to cope with the demands of the group. And Secondly, the group is able to cope and continue to function as a group with the presence of this person. Because if either of these demands aren't met, then it's likely that this won't be sustainable. This is going to end pretty badly, pretty quickly. And it usually means that there's a separation. And that's really hard for someone with a disability. Uh, lots of hopes are upon their success with this because they've experienced lots of rejection already. And we don't really want our efforts to change that to result in more rejection for people. It's like a wound that people have. Well, if they're already wounded, the last thing they need is some more wounding. So you want to do this carefully and uh, with a lot of consciousness and forethought to increase the chances that what you're about to set up is going to be successful. Uh, many years ago, a fellow named Lou Brown, Lou Brown and his associates, Lou was a, a parent and it's particularly strong in the employment area, like 30 years ago. We're just beginning to catch up to where they were then uh, in this stuff. They would do what's called an ecological inventory. So if a person was going into a new situation, they would examine what the situation, situation requires a person to be able to do. Let's say you're going to McDonald's and it'd be nicer to have another restaurant perhaps, but, but you all know what I mean. So if we were to analyze McDonald's, it's about walk, you know, opening the door, lining up in the queue, assessing the menu, choosing what you want, asking for it, waiting, paying, taking the tray, finding a table, returning the tray, putting the papers in the bin, and leaving the restaurant, something like that. So you'd map that out and then you'd see what of all of that can this person do? And you might find that there's a gap between what's required and what the person can do unsupported. And so you have a decision to make, how are you going to fill the gap? And some might say, well, let's teach the gap. Let's help the person get across the gap that they have and so that the person becomes independent and proficient in that gap. And then there might be calculations. What if the person, even over a long time, doesn't get that gap? 
then that's where the idea of trying another way came in. Uh, Mark Gold and his work, which has become more uh, well known of late, which is lovely to see because it's great stuff. And therefore, there might be another way that we do this. And then they explore how do you get around this when you can't do those things entirely for yourself. And uh, and so rather than say this person can't do this and therefore can't go there and uh, you try another way. Um, as, as our friend Lorna Sullivan would say, you have to think like water. When you hit a barrier, water goes around it. You've got to think like water. Don't allow the barrier to stop you. Now, what this means then is that there's lots of preparation before you enter a new setting. You examine the setting in terms of what it's required, what's required for someone to successfully interact with this setting. And then the question is, how will you prompt this person for those for those kind of signals. It might be about a dress code as you enter a bowls club. How will you provide that signal to people? Or will there be some natural cues that are there? Are there some signage? Or do you pay attention to what other people do? And uh, I once went into a bowls club with my hat still on. I got told off a bit because there's a rule. And it's a pretty strict rule about not wearing hats within the bowls club. And, uh, and so you have to do the preparation because I see people entering new environments and they've been given no cues or heads up about anything associated with that environment. They're not even being told that's where they're going and then things don't go so well. And in some places I see in the community, they've actually banned groups of people now because it went so badly. And I think, well, who let them down? That shouldn't have occurred because the, the preparation, the homework uh, needed to be done. And, and therefore, what is it the person needs to know about that setting? And has there been some augmentation of that communication here? Does the person have some way that the information about it can be put across to them in a way that they can understand? Uh, there's one young lass, she's only school age, but when she is approached to see if she'd like to do something, she invariably answers no to that, to that question. Would you like to do some craft now? Olivia, you know, and no. And really, I think what she's saying is for me to answer, yes, I'd need to know what in the world you're talking about. I'd need to understand what it is you have in mind. And w invariably, when you lay that out for it, well, we're going to do some painting today and we're going to paint giraffes. And you love giraffes, don't you know? And so, oh, yeah, off we go. And it's like what she needs is information. Uh, but sometimes at school when she says no, the teachers kind of want to punish her in a way or I've got to stop her from saying no. Well, she actually doesn't know what you're talking about and she needs more information. So quite often people might be reluctant and reticent because they really don't know what's going on. So we might have to spend some time communicating in a form that the person understands and there might be some... Um, concrete versions of that, photographs, people, this is what we're doing. And of course, linking it to some of the interests and motivations. This young Olivia, she loves giraffes. And so when you mention, well, we're going to paint this giraffe today, it was like, oh, you know, and uh, because of plugging into the motivation. And so then the interest comes and then the interest in doing things well comes as well. And uh, you're not going to have blow ups by people entering situations that they had not anticipated the demands associated with it. There might be a bit of noise in this place. Are you going to be able to handle noise? What are we going to do when you hear all this noise of the poker machines? Um, those those kind of things might need to be predicted. In what ways might, does the person run off? What are we going to do if the person runs off? Um, and therefore, being clear about the cues and prompts that will be provided. And the thing is that that role requirement is there from day one. Don't say, oh, let him settle in. And then we might tell him what it's really about later. Because if he settles into a habit, then you're going to have a hard time ever breaking that habit, running to the front of a queue instead of lining up at the end. You might even need other people in the line to say, hey, mate, go back to the end and wait your turn. Sort it out in advance and know what people are going to do. And um, now, a couple of other things to do with how do you create the link then to other people? You're doing something that other people also are interested in. So that brings people together. They share a common interest. So And they begin to see the other person as something like themselves. So that's a kind of great step. You're trying to build identification. Identification is your key. Do observers identify with this person? 
as being like themselves. And if they see that this person's interested and loves the things that we love to do, then he must be like us. And again, it overcomes then the difficulty of seeing this person as not quite human in some, some kind of way. And um, so one of the things um, that we might call upon here is to try and identify someone who can act as a mediator and invitee someone who might be a key to getting us into this environment because we too might be on the outside of this unless we're members of the tennis club or the you know that we're members of the art society but if we're not we may be having to find someone who is and who's who's got a pretty open outlook and willing to invite people with all from all sorts of backgrounds and identities and the other interesting aspect of this is that the person also themselves is someone of good standing that maybe the group also looks up to. So if this person is accepting the presence of our new member, then others will as well because everyone looks up to this person. So sometimes you've got to go after, remember this is a tactic, you might not always do it, but think about this is that you go after the best artist, you go after the best football player, you go after the best tennis player because if the best tennis player accepts this person, and is willing to make the accommodations for this person's presence uh, within the club, then it means then everybody else is much more likely to do that as well. If he or she identifies with this person, so can, so can everybody else. And I have some stories, but we're running out of time uh, about where this very thing took place. And uh, now an, an added feature here, though, is that when you do then approach this person and ask them for some involvement, keep it small. You can't go up and say, would you be Stanley's friend? Well, asking them to be Stanley's friend is a bit like saying, will you marry Stanley? It's just a bit big and you can't predict friendship. You've just got to create the circumstances where it might occur. But if you say, do you mind if he has his first beer with you? You know, oh, yeah. Oh. What's wrong with having a first beer? It's nice and small. It's very doable. It doesn't put anything on the person, but you've now laid the groundwork, a, a, a context for bringing them together and also a role for this person in relation to the person they're getting to know. That person needs a role as well. And by a simple request like that, um, do you, I, I understand that you drive by our place on the way to church. I wonder if you'd mind calling in and picking Tom up because he'd like to attend as well. You know, so this is a really reasonable request. This is not some high level request, just a small step, something that's not very big, entirely reasonable for anyone that's part of that, that kind of club. Now, if he refuses, and you might have to question, is this the best place? Because sometimes there's warfare in community groups and the group might not be in such a strong place for you right now. So asking something small. So remember, you can't predict the friendship. You can only set the scene. Now, in part of all of this, just to finish, is the staff role that's part of this. You might have paid staff that are part and parcel of this arrangement. Now, if staff look like and are recognized as staff from like a 200 meters, then already the signal is that the person coming into this club is a client of someone, and therefore there's something wrong with them. And they're going to be, then if they need support, means that we don't have to provide it, right? Because there's a staff member. So when staff are present, they need to be in a non-service role. They need to look like they're not staff. They need to be in a role that matches the one the person seeking and holding the role is in as well. So a gym member is a nice example because the staff member might also be a gym member. They, they become co-participants. They're in the gym together. And that means that the staff member has to be attuned to those role requirements and fulfills those roles requirements as well, enabling the interaction and connection and perhaps relationship with other people, not being a block to it because they come across as a staff member with their uniform and their lanyards and, and stopping people talking because they haven't had a police check. You know, these kind of interferences of expectation and locking people back into service roles. Uh, you wouldn't want that at all. So having to be, and, and for those of you who are family members here who are um, developing approaches for your son and daughter entering the community with the use of staff, there needs to be some discussion then what's a matching role for the staff member 
that is offering some side-by-side -side support but doesn't look like they're a staff member, uh, much more like a friend, a member, another member of the community. And in those ways, doesn't block the expectations of other observers in this situation that somehow they don't have to be bothered with this person because they already have a support worker. Those kind of things. So subtle things, aren't they? Nuances about how, how all of this occurs. And sometimes the variables will be different and you'll have to rethink some of this about how you go forward with it and bring people together in a way that's sustainable and successful. So let me stop there, talk quite enough, and go back to Jan um, and Jackie and see if there's any questions that uh, there might be. Let's hear from you. Hi, John. That was fantastic. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, so get your questions in. We do have one here. A group continuing to function as a group uh, with that person included. This is something that can happen very easily at school and the student within can be ostracised by the class or group. If the educators undermine the value of the student, and are resistant to trying another way. This this can also be complicated by the perception of vulnerability of that student. Do you have any general strategy? Mm, yeah. Um, when there are authorities on the scene, and especially in the context of children, they take their cues from what the authorities do. We do too. Uh, if If all of a sudden some leader says it's okay to hate a group, a lot of us will. We're being given to mission to hate someone. And so uh, uh, the, the role authority plays here is critical. And we know that even in a school context, the role of a principal is absolutely critical to how all the other teachers and therefore how all the other pupils will respond to that child. Um, the intriguing thing here is that in school, lots and lots of kids are going to be fragile, have, have identities that are still forming and be quite fragile. So this is very tricky. And one of the, the things you, many of you will have encountered in school is to, to what extent are other kids willing to interact with this child because it might threaten their own identity? They're, they're all wondering about three things. You know, am I good? Am I competent? And am I worthy of love? They're kind of three major questions we we often ask about our identity as we grow up, and we need some clear answers to these questions. And school it seems to be, as we've all experienced, we've had kids that have teased us, sometimes relentlessly, sometimes not. But if, and, and it's interesting, bullies go after those three questions. You know, no one wants to play with you. You know, who wants you? You know, and, and they can get really nasty. We've seen online versions of this as well. So school is tricky if the school as a whole, as a community itself, is not functioning very strongly, including some of the teachers. You go into some schools, and uh, uh, I haven't been in a school for a long time, but that's my background as a teacher, is that the identity of the school and of the teachers in it is also a bit fragile. So taking on children with additional support requirements, uh, we word that, can be difficult because by associating with such a child, I might threaten my own standing. And therefore, it's often the most confident kids that are willing to, I don't care what you guys think. He's a great kid and, and I'm going to look after him. I'm going to make my friend and we're going to do stuff together. Um, and you realize then the whole tone of the school would need to change that would support that kind of cultural atmosphere. Um, they are around, but uh, good luck with finding finding some because all the kids are going through a fragile state. And it's therefore, how do we help the kids become a little more resilient and not that afraid then to befriend someone um, and, and feel that somehow their own identity now has been let down through that association? Remember, you're known by the company you keep when we came up on this board. And... Uh, uh, up here, the groupings, you're known by the company you keep. And uh, so now when the teachers themselves aren't modeling that kind of acceptance and approach of every child, now you've got a problem because they are really opening a big door to allow the other kids, then they're being commissioned permission to bully. And in spite of all the discussions and the narrative and, and the education department policies about this stuff, it 
almost every second week you hear of more reports about kids being bullied. Um, and we've heard in, in the um, Commission of Inquiry that uh, children at school being bullied sometimes relentlessly because they become the scapegoat for everyone. And uh, he carries on the shoulders, you might say, the failures of everybody else. And everybody else elevates their status. They get put down because everybody then, in comparison, feels a sense of status. And um, so it means that even the bullies are troubled kids. And, and therefore, it's like, how do we look after a school community so that the kids aren't so troubled um, and have to have a psychological outlet uh, to, to elevate themselves in such awful ways? Um, so I don't have any From magic Michelle. remedy. There, there are some, uh, we could have a longer discussion with time uh, because there are sometimes some background circumstances around the, both the, the bully and those who are bullied. That, that might be looked at, but um, yeah, that's that's an answer, but it's not much of an answer, I'm afraid. Yeah, I was responding saying, yes, that's so true. Our daughter's closest friends are very strong-minded and confident little people. Yeah, there um, you go. Ones who are very mm -hmm. fragile, started well, but ended um, spectacularly right. badly. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, so I, mean, I guess it's just investing in those shared yeah. interests and strengthening, like providing those opportunities where that can strengthen their relationship, the ones that are confident. Um, we've got another question, John, a question about image. My daughter likes to hug, hug me as a means to get connection as well as um, pressure. Any tactics to help her understand the image she's portraying and help her to get um, the connection and pressure in a different way? Mm. That's, that's right. Um... Some things uh, I've seen people adopt uh, ways of interacting that are largely habitual. Um, and, and it's like when I'm not sure of how else I might behave in this situation, uh, I default back to the standard. Um, we often refer to these things as rigid rules. They may be like when I meet mum, I hug her and that's a rule. And to some extent, the, the good news about this is that you can provide with a bit of reinforcement new rules um, or rules that operate under slightly different situations where you might say, you know, at home we're going to have a lovely hug and I'll give you home. But here, not hugging each other right now. Um, whatever clear way you're able to communicate that, um, that there's a difference now and that that rule gets applied. And use it as a rule. People tend to respond to what you do better than why you do it. The why is a kind of analytical approach. Analysis is a bit tougher for many young people with intellectual disabilities. And uh, but tell me what to do. Now I'll do that and I'll do it really well. And, uh, and I'll do that perhaps for the rest of my life until someone gives me another rule for doing things. Um, so what, not why. The whys do come, but a little later. When a person's been doing something for a fair while now, you can introduce the reason we do this is rather than the beginning point. Uh, we, you know, I want you to do this because I'm concerned about you presenting an image that makes you younger than you really are. Might just be a little bit too abstract as opposed to not here at home. You know, in some clear way, and uh, but you have to reinforce that, and you'll have to follow the rule as well. That is, if you implement the rule, then you have to follow it, um, and and so be pretty f firm, but also offering reinforcement when um, that's great, you know, and uh, and then move on. Yeah. yeah, it's it's a tough one because it's a, affection for some people is one of their assets, and and so it's a it, you feel a bit hard of I, they they interact with the world in an affectionate manner, um, and to some extent it's, it makes them even more vulnerable because when you know if they're told terrible things or hit or harmed in some way, it, it's such a terrible thing for them to experience because their outlook on the world is largely one of friendship and affection. Um, and you think, wow, how do how do we arm someone that not everybody's going to love you? And they can be downright mean because, you know, as they go to the world, anyone. Uh, so I, I know one young lass, she tends to categorize people into you're my friend, you're not my friend. <laughs> and 
but you're her friend and she would want to hug you, I would imagine. But you're having to make a, a, a context rule here. In this context, I don't want your image, that's what you're thinking, your image to be degraded as a result of seeing you just hugging all the time. And it can become overbaked in many people's lives right through into later adulthood, where essentially the only way they relate to people is by hugging them. So it is an issue, and I'm really glad that you've picked up on it. Mm. Yeah, and it also could be around the pressure, that um, that need for that pressure as well. Um, but there's all, I think, you know, while we've got a good group of people in the room, maybe this is a good opportunity to do some brainstorming about what the alternative could be. Um, mentioned that her son arrests people um, when, they, when they're not so sure how to interact. And I know other young people like scare people, which is usually something that happens when they're quite young. But it's coming up with the alternative and then teaching that, that this is what you That's do. Right. Um, if anyone's got some good ideas, pop them in the chat. <laughs> So you can see the rigid rules at work and how prominent they can be in people's lives when it's harder for people to work out what I might do here as a problem solving exercise. So people tend to adopt a singular rule approach and might even adopt a rule that doesn't work but still continues to do it um, because you'd have to have good analysis to work out what else I might do. Uh, and, and so some people do have rules that are not very successful and can get them into all sorts of trouble, but they may not understand the consequences of those things, not even connect the consequence with the, with the action that they, they have performed that have brought the consequence about. They may not make that connection, which means they're not going to necessarily stop it because they had a bad consequence. They may not connect those two things. So that's why they may need someone perhaps to help them form a new rule and one that works better. One that perhaps is a bit more flexible under most conditions. Um, thanks for that, uh, John. Um, there's been a couple of comments such as weight vests um, and some concerns that I think what happens for a lot of young people, even when the family's working very hard to change that kind of behaviour, it gets reinforced often in schools where the adults, um, the authority doesn't get on board with it or whoever sort of gets initiated into that game, whether it's scaring or being arrested, they go along with it. So it reinforces to the person that this that's, is okay. That's right. Yeah. That's right. So that's interesting is that some things that people do that are not very helpful for someone may be done with good intention. Mm. Uh, that's that's very common where people think oh he doesn't have to pay he can go and, and they're working from good intention but that's not what we want no he's going to pay like everybody else remember because we want them to participate and we want them in that normative part of the community therefore in a sense if this is what's required to do this here then he does it too and there are no exceptions to that or few exceptions to that um, absolutely can I just mention, Jan, before people head off, uh, that that intellectual disability event is also online and I have a range of training of 22 hours of training in 10 programs. And one of the topics, of course, is the, is the workshop on the impact of intellectual impairment. And they can inquire, get this brochure online at the website johnarmstrong.media, just my name, johnarmstrong.media, for information about that. And many families are using this because if you're employing staff, some of them are untrained, you want something that's going to be a good basis for how best to support your son and daughter. So this isn't about the NDIS. It's not how to get more funding or how to treat a support coordinator. It doesn't cover any of that kind of stuff. It's just about how do you meet the needs of someone across 10 separate topics? And uh, so go there. And while I'm in advertising mode, there's a new book because we're all getting older and you'll want the book about the connects SRV to situations of supporting people who are aging. And this is a great book. It's just out, brand new. And you'll want to get your hands on this. Got great chapters in it. Um, there are three chapters by Wolfensberger uh, that have never been published. So new material from Wolf, and uh, you can get this at the Community Resource Unit in queenslandcrew.org.au or go to Belonging Matters website in, in Victoria, belongingmatters.com.au. So for your 
just off the press like two weeks ago. So you won't want to miss that. That'll that'll get you to sleep in nothing flat if you take that to bed with you. So and, uh, for all of those, the book and where like where you can purchase it in a follow up email from the. Uh, thank you, thank you for that, Jan. Also, just on John's um, training. Uh, I've purchased it using um, some of my son's NGIS planning uh, funding to then do some training with his staff. So it's a great way to get pretty cheap. Yeah, pretty cheap. Yeah, uh, it's pretty good. good. Yeah. Your staff and yeah. Everybody. And it's important that you have that discussion with your staff about now we've learned these principles, how do we apply them to our son and daughter? And uh, and any manager of a service would need to do the same thing. So it's a wonderful way to interact with your staff about the things that make the real difference uh, in, in the direction that you had to fulfill the vision you have for your son and daughter. Um, so, yeah, it's uh, a good resource. Well, yeah. maybe I shouldn't say whether it's a good resource or not, but thank you, Jen, for, for saying that uh, you right. got and lots out of it. We continue to use it. Um, I've just got another idea around uh, pressure is rolling feet um, is another way of applying pressure. So you could be doing that before you go out possibly. Um, a question, how to approach a senior club member who is inadvertently suggested a role in public um, that is devaluing. Yeah, um, yeah. When they were trying to actually be helpful, so yeah. Yes, yeah. Uh, uh, it's interesting, there are, th there are several of the deviancy roles, so the eternal child, the object of pity and the sick and diseased organism, they're all negative roles but can be given to people with the very best of intentions. And of course, some of the roles that people might insist upon have something to do with the stereotypes that have been handed down over centuries. And so for people who you might say are naive or ignorant or unconscious, um, without necessarily being downright nasty, but there might be some of those as well, might therefore create demeaning suggestions for roles of people as part of their ignorance, because in one sense, they don't yet know the person. Um, and, and that's that interim period where the person first appears and they're still a stranger, but maybe seen as a stranger that incorporates many stereotypes that's in the minds of the observers already that, that, that they hold, have held through their own upbringing and, and cultural expectations. And to some extent, how they've seen services operate up until the re, uh, recent time, where, where the service system locked away people, where the service system congregated and segregated and transported people and gave them terrible day programs and terrible appearances and, deviancy dances and and the only thing people seem to be good at was 10 pin bowling you know so lots of things have been done to reinforce those those stereotypes so we can't always be too hard on the community because their ideas were reinforced by the authorities which which was our mob those before us i should say and uh, whereas now we're in an era where we're wanting to change that um, so uh, whether you then publicly also suggest that, uh, well, we had something else in mind, like, you know, but if you think there's a risk that then this person's reputation might get injured because you want them as an ally rather than as an enemy straight off the bat. And if they're made to look foolish in some way, then you may have done your dash, especially if they're a prominent person, you're trying to bring them on side. This might also suggest that in In preparing the way, some of that is about preparing the way with some of the other actors on the scene before you get there and may mean that we want to have a word with some key people about what it is we're doing. One thing I might have neglected to suggest here, I might have had it here, but God, I thought I wrote it into my notes here, is that tell people the role you're after. Just say, look, he's wanting to become a tennis player or he's wanting to become a choir member not he's doing cooking, he's becoming a kitchen hand or a chef. It, name the role. And when you name the role, they know what you're after. Uh, people understand roles because it's a normative, regular, everyday thing. So tell them the role, not your activity, because you're converting an activity into a role here. And therefore, let them in on that. 
You could even do that in, in front of the person that you're supporting because they need to know the name of this role as well and say, you're the cook. What's for dinner tonight? And you see people then elevate themselves to the role requirements rather than like, well, we're doing cooking and I want you to watch what I'm going to do, you know, because kind of, they've been doing that for 20 years, but they're still not allowed in the kitchen. It's a sense that they now have to become something. And that's what you're asking of your community when you let them in on this. And some of your preparation you do before entering the setting is to let them know we're trying to open the door to someone who's seeking to be this role. And we're wondering if you can help us. What would we need to know to help him do that successfully? And you'll find most reasonable people will, but maybe not everybody. And uh, for the same reasons, perhaps, as the school kids, you know, they're not in a good space themselves. They, you know, breakdowns and addictions and all sorts of problems that regular people have uh, that challenge them. And they may feel ill-equipped or just uh, no psychic space to to give way to someone else. So you're having to find groups that are pretty much together um, and therefore aren't thrown or afraid of the presence of someone new. Now, some of the men's sheds are great, but I've heard that whole group homes are being kind of dumped on a local men's shed and the staff take off or go out smoking and leave the men to, to grapple with five or six residents of a group home. It's hardly fair and it's hardly sustainable. Um, so they haven't done the preparation right here at all. Would it be more constructive for service providers to formalise policy requiring staff to wear clothes that reflect the activities that they and the other people are supporting um, are engaging in? Yes, yes. I, I'm not sure if you make that stuff policy and mandatory because we actually want staff to get this um, without having to make a rule of it. Like everything's a rule these days about masks. It's like we no longer can be responsible to think for ourselves, but they too are being let in on this is what we're trying to do here. So what kind of appearance do you think is going to match that and see if they come along because it's an internalized state, not just a feature of compliance, something they have to do because someone else said so. We want their heart to be changed by being put in a good role as well. Uh, both of them win um, in that regard. Um, now, if they don't measure up then, if they still come inappropriately dressed, then there's that's a good stage for f some straight feedback and just saying you are risking this person's presence in this group because you can. we're paying you as a professional. And we're giving you a chance to occupy a role that makes sense in regard to the role the person's in. Because just being a support worker that says, oh, I provide support, well, where's the future in that? You want the workers to grow in this as well. And so being clear about, and that's part of your preparation, they need to walk out the door looking like they're in the right role that complements the role the, the other person is after. And so together, they they send a confirming signal. But I'm not sure mandating it. I'd much rather that this becomes a principle of good practice as opposed to a, a law of compliance. And it's you're, you're trying to change the heart. You're not just commanding the head in a sense um, in, in that approach. Because uh, after all, staff end up just following procedures and now half of them they don't even understand and the other half of them are not even really necessary. They actually undermine their relevant support because they're busy filling in bits of paper about what they've done. You know, like it gets overwhelming, that stuff. And it creates fear, like do it or else. Um, so, um, but I know what you mean. If this is good practice, why isn't it just there? Absolutely. Um, but I'd, I'd like to work with people before I start um, Resorting to the law is like a last option, I think. it's a it, You're twisting an arm, essentially saying, you are unwilling to do this, I will fix you. And I'm, I'm not sure that you would, of, of course, not mean that at all. Um, but it does, does reflect the seriousness of what we're asking them to do. There's a lot riding on this staff role and how that comes across. We'd like them to get it right, yeah. I mean, it's, it's often hard enough to get people to pay attention to what the person with disabilities image is like, um, let alone themselves, but actually bringing that together so they're That's right. helping the person That's present right. the best possible, the best possible. Absolutely.
and then they complement that. So That's right. I mean, there are people that want the world to accept them as they are in any awful way, um, and I'm not sure the world uh, it may come to that. Um, but if they apply that to the person they're supporting, they may then apply it to themselves, like you can look like a grub and you're expecting everybody else to accept you as a valued worker, mm -hmm. but you look like a grub um, in, in some way. And I don't think that's, in a sense, that if, if a staff member looks, you know, dirty and lazy and, and so on, that's, a, that's an image load being put on the person they're supporting now who can do without that image load being laid upon them. The worker might get away with that, but it's an image now being laid upon the person and they don't need that, right? Mm -hmm. they, they need a really positive, um, uh, present kind of image uh, of a staff member that is competent and knows what they're doing and is alert and not on their phone all the time, is actually present in the situation. It's what it kind of means to be person-centered, I suppose, is they're present for the person, not for themselves. Mm. That's so true. And I think that ecological inventory, that's just so important for not only work, like setting people up for work, but also schools. Like how are we, how is that setting, really setting mm -hmm. Um, young people up for what to expect when they go back to school for a new year. They don't know who the teacher is. They don't know what the classroom looks no. like. It's, and then we just expect um, people that find that very difficult to just fit mm. in. That's very difficult. Yes. Yeah. Even, even university has orientation weeks. Mm -hmm. weeks of orientation at the beginning of uni and usually as kids go from primary school to high school they will also have I've got granddaughters who are now visiting their high school now for that they're going to next year and so they're setting the kids she's got a uniform so she goes in uniform and she's still in primary school but she's going to the high school and and getting on the bus and the whole deal is kind of sorted out and uh, and these are children without disabilities but they're setting them up to succeed same kind of flavor here set the person up to succeed what would they need to know in order to succeed in this situation and uh, it just amazes me that we take people into circumstances without any preparation or prompting at all and then expect them to know what to do i just just amazes me mm. Well, thank you very much john that's just been so wonderful i'm sorry everybody that if you haven't been able to view the screen as clearly as possible, we will um, capture that information and share it in the notes. Um, and I'm also wondering, John, if you could just say the name of that book again. There's been some people oh, who look that up it's now. Age, aging and the Good Things of Life, the Application of Social Role Valorization to Supporting People as They Age. We thought we needed a nice long title like the titles Wolfensberger uses. So we're being quite consistent with, <laughs> with a wolf title. But Aging in the Good Things of Life, the Application of Social Role Valorization to Supporting People as They Age. Now, if you write to Crew or Belonging Matters and just say you're after the aging book, they'll know which one you mean. So sure. don't worry about having to get that title exactly. But it's nice, nice book, lovely print inside. It's very readable lovely feel it's about 37 dollars, i believe so okay. I, I think a bargain yeah great mm. thank you and thank you again john so much it's just been so wonderful to be able to drill down into different aspects of what srv theory can um mm. help us in order to get the good things in life for people with disabilities so thank you so much. and thank, thank you jan great to be on today with you all thank you so much great yeah. being with you